All right, Eric, thank you, for, thank you for being here and spending some time with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, let's dive right in. Yeah. Um, you know, Marquee Ventures spun out of the Chicago Cubs. Let's take it back to 2016, November 3rd. It's about 11.57 p.m. Central Time. Yep. Um, or November 3rd, yeah, right? The game was November 2nd, That's but it right. ended on November 3rd. Yep. Tenth inning, ground ball to third base. Chris yep. Bryant scoops it up, almost slips in the process, throws it to Rizzo. Yep. Curse is broken, Cubs win. Where were you in that moment, and what did that feel like? Yeah, so I grew up a Cubs fan. Uh, I wasn't working, working for them, but um, I, it, it's an interesting Chicago story. So I was actually out of town that day on a work trip, and I thought I was going to make it home from, uh, I was in Charlotte, and I thought I was going to make it home for the start of the game. The flight gets delayed because Obama is in town <laughs> and shuts down the airport. So I'm literally like trying to watch the game on my phone. Like try, and so then I finally make it back to Chicago. It's pouring rain, so the flight was delayed landing. Um, and then it got delayed, right? And I actually had, had a, uh, should we slide apart a little? Yeah. I'm just gonna so, so my daughter was born like uh, two weeks before that. So we were in full like chaos mode and falling asleep all the time. Um, so I fell asleep and then woke up it, when they came back on the field. So I was in my apartment. Switch. Yeah, that way we won't get the feedback. There we go. I think that's better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was in my apartment with my wife and baby daughter. My wife was asleep. And so I was by myself, uh, had just woken up like out of a uh, sound sleep on the couch uh, to watch the, uh, the extra innings. So <laughs> that's a complicated story. Um, but it, it was amazing having grown up a Cubs fan. Um, now that I work, uh, kind of in the same building. I'm surrounded by like photos of that day and you know, copies of the uh, newspapers and all sorts of memorabilia. So when you work in sports, that's not far from everyone's mind. And hopefully this year we'll get another one, right? Yeah. Team's shaping up pretty well this year, I think. <laughs> um, you were a Cubs fan growing up. Just, should we just trade this microphone back and forth? Yeah, you want me to turn this off? Yeah. Or use this one. Yeah, yours is the better yeah, yeah. one. All right. All right. Yeah, better? Okay. Yeah. Um, you were a Cubs fan growing yep. up. Did you play baseball growing up? Did you play sports? And like, if so, what lessons did they teach you or not teach you? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I did play sports. I, I played baseball. I uh, wasn't really good enough to, to go very far, probably just size-wise. I was kind of like the fast outfielder. Couldn't really hit for power. Doesn't get you very far. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, I played soccer, I played golf, I played a bunch of things, but I, was, I, I realized pretty early that I, I was not gonna be pursuing uh, a career um, and just did it for fun. I think, you know, you, lear you learn how to work with teams, you learn um, failure, you learn defeat, which I think are some of the greatest lessons uh, youth sports teaches, uh, resiliency, um, and, and those are hard to, to learn outside of a sports environment, or, you know, I guess in other competitive settings you can, but. Um, to me, that, that's the takeaway. It's almost like losing, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, kids need to learn how to lose. <laughs> Book that one. Put yeah, it right? Kids right? need to learn how to lose. Right, right. <laughs> All right, so um, getting into your professional career, uh, when you first kind of got into venture capital, mm -hmm. I don't mean to age you here, but it was about 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, you were interning at a firm called 76 Capital. Yep. Uh, I have to imagine VC has changed at least a little bit since 20 years ago. What are some of the key differences you've seen, or when you look at the landscape, what was it like then yeah. versus what it's like now? Um, so it, it was a lot less competitive. Um, it was, um, you know, it was it was less of an industry back then, right? And it was more of like a um, a practice or a um, almost like an art form. Uh, I think you know there wasn't as much data available. Um, deals weren't priced based on crunch base, or um, you, you just didn't have the, the data flow. And deal flow was also less um, less easy, right? Like right now, you can go uh, pitch a bunch of investors. It's it's almost like a cookie cutter process. Back then, it was uh, an investor found a company he really liked, he or she liked. You'd sit down, you'd kind of hash out. Um, a negotiated term sheet. It was a lot fewer uh, competitive term sheets, um, so it was it was kind of more of a of an interesting process. 
and, and you didn't have a lot of angel investors, right? You, you, had, um, you had people who had built and sold their businesses, but you know, they just put their money in the stock market or you know, bond funds. It, it, it was kind of a very, uh, you know, let's say less mature space than it is today. And then when you read historically, you know, I think we're, we're somewhere on the spectrum uh, of going to even a, a state where it's more competitive for investors, um, easier to raise money, hopefully, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think if anyone's interested in startups and venture, I'd go read the history, like read how it actually started um, and go all the way back to like whaling, right? Like that's where it really started, where venture started, right? So all you founders out there, you're kind of like, you know, whaling ship guides trying to raise money for your, for your trip, yeah. right? <laughs> it, is, it is a fascinating story. Like they would commission these, like whales, you know, brought in yeah. whale bones, whale oil, all this stuff. So they'd, you'd invest in a boat hoping it would return a big catch right. back. Uh, now there is a book, I think it's called like, it's got a green cover. It's like the history of VC. Honestly, I don't recommend reading it. It's just not interesting. It, it is about like the yeah. history, but it's like drier than textbook yeah. Yeah. dry. You can so. find it. I mean, you can just Google history of VC. And yes, that, that's probably better. a better yeah. route. Don't, don't get this book. <laughs> yeah. I apologize if the yeah. author ever yeah. listens to this or watches yeah. this. Um, okay, so um, you mentioned earlier some experience playing baseball. Mm -hmm. Obviously, now you're at a firm that in a way is tied yeah. to baseball, which we'll get into in a minute. But um, you also spent some time recently with the PGA. Yep. Specifically, they've got a new ventures division, which is all about um, finding investment and growth mm -hmm. opportunities outside of yep. just what the PGA is doing and outside of the game of golf. Um, what are some of the opportunities that you saw there for where the game of golf could go? Yeah. And from any of, the, any of your time there with investments you made or someone on your team made, have we seen any of that stuff now like on the PGA Tour or even yep. just otherwise commercially? Yeah, uh, for sure. So um, when I was there, so sports betting uh, wasn't a, a, a big thing back then, right? So my group got tasked with figuring out how the PGA Tour should play in sports betting, right? So we, we negotiated the sports rights deal um, with IMG that eventually led to all the productization of golf. So if anyone's bet on golf, uh, that's something you've seen. Um, and that was a very novel structure because there are all sorts of legal issues and being a league. Um, the other thing you might have seen, there's a, there's a company that they just announced called Arcos that is a sensor that goes in your golf club and allows you to track play. And so players finally on the tour being allowed to use that. Uh, we looked at everything from simulators, so indoor golf simulators, uh, to uh, top golf, to things like that. Um, we also did some things on the media side, the travel side in Europe. Uh, so we were all over the place. And then I worked on the uh, European tour investment uh, where the PGA Tour uh, worked on uh, kind of a, a partnership uh, with the European Tour to try to bring the game uh, global. So. I can tell you with confidence right now, I do not need a tracker to tell you how bad the <laughs> yeah, swing is. Yeah, right. <laughs> When the ball ends up not on the fairway, that's an indication <laughs> yeah. of, of, yeah. of how the swing yeah. goes. Um, okay, so let's talk marquee. Um, it is this fun, this vehicle that's spun out of the Chicago Cubs. Mm -hmm. You know, what makes the Cubs wake up one day and be like, we need to be in venture. Yeah. And then kind of talk us through like the structure as well, because yeah. it came from the Cubs, but it's not technically yep. part of the Cubs. Talk us through how that, all that yeah. works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I'd say first, um, you know, the, the Cubs leadership, whether that's Tom Ricketts or, or Crane Kenny, they have deep roots in, in the startup world. Um, they both, uh, you know, Crane more on the investing side and building side, Tom had a, a couple startups. Um, so they, they have the, the passion and the energy. Um, you know, throughout the years since the Ricketts bought the team, they made uh, some one-off early stage investments that actually did pretty well. Um, but it was taking up a lot of time. They didn't have a team dedicated to it. So they, they came to a crossroads and said, if, if we're going to do this, we should either do it uh, with the right structure and, and approach, or we should be passing on most of these. It doesn't make sense um, to do one off here or there. You're not, you don't know what's going on in the market. You don't know all the competition. Uh, you, do, you just don't have the deal flow, right? So um, fast forward to uh, this was probably two, three years ago when they decided that they wanted to make this a pillar of the um, kind of ecosystem they're building. Uh, we talked about the real estate development arm earlier, but they've built a few companies in and around the Cubs, right? So they have a real estate arm, um, they do uh, media, they have a streaming channel, 
Um, so they, they're always looking for more opportunities and they wanted this to be a pillar of that going forward. Um, so we came up with a, uh, and they approached me to do this, so we came up with a structure that would work, kind of a lead into this. Um, so the way, it's, the way it's structured, it's, it's a separate entity from the Cubs, uh, but it's, it's capital from the ownership group. Um, the reason it's separate for the, from the Cubs is we didn't want it to be a corporate uh, vehicle. So we didn't want it to be investing with the priorities of the Cubs. We almost wanted to flip that on its head and say, we want to invest with the insights from the Cubs, uh, the insights we get from our consumer engagement, the insights from our real estate business. Um, and we didn't want to be hindered by having uh, you know, financial motives and uh, corporate strategic motives. Because I think you know, when you look at a lot of corporate venture funds, they struggle with that construct. It's like, are we serving uh, our core business or are we trying to find the best companies uh, that we know how to you know, help? So we, we set it up as a separate entity, uh, but then we have um, kind of a variety of shared services agreements where we work uh, with the Cubs team, um, specifically on the, the health and wellness side, because we're, we're talking about that tonight. Um, I work closely with the R&D group uh, down, down in the, the baseball side. So those, those are the guys who are basically trying to figure out how can we use technology, how can we use science uh, to make the team better. Um, and so they work on a variety of you know, Skunk Works projects. Some of those interact with, with the venture world, some don't. Um, but then we also work with our sponsorship group. Uh, we work with our media team. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities that, that we can collaborate uh, with, Cub, with the Cubs team um, to make our portfolio companies stronger and, and uh, better for the future. So the, the thesis of yeah. Marquee Ventures is investing in and partnering with new early stage companies that are reimagining commerce, entertainment, mm -hmm. and sports. Um, can you help kind of narrow that in a little bit? Like yeah. when, we, when we say reimagine, what, yeah. what do you think of when you say reimagining in those fields? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know it when you see it. I know that's an easy <laughs> answer, but, but uh, um, you know, in a, a lot of cases, it's, um, it's changes in consumer behavior. Um, it's changes in technology. So we're looking for macro trends that are intersecting those fields. Um, one, of the, one of the ways I've answered this question before, I think it, it helps, it's, you know, I, we, we want to find companies that at scale, like customers can't live without. So, so rather than saying like a customer really likes this, like I want to find a business that's reimagining how a customer does something, whether that's a business or a consumer. And if that were, were to go away, they'd be really pissed, right? So like that, that's kind of what we're looking for. And to me, that's uh, kind of reimagining either those um, use cases, reimagining distribution. It could be reimagining technology. Um, and you know, there are a variety of, I can kind of use this for, for the portfolio companies, but you know, one, one example is a company called Anzu that has IP to deliver um, programmatic advertising directly into video games. So I think you're, you're sitting there playing uh, Grand Theft Auto or your MLB The Show, um, and the ads in the game are actually real programmatic 3D uh, targeted to you as the player. Um, and, and so you reimagine how brands interact with consumers, right? Like consumers are spending their free time in video games. They're also gambling. Um, but, you know, like brands can't reach them anymore. They're not, they can't go to the TV outlets um, Digital has all sorts of problems. So this company actually kind of reimagined and is now retraining brands and, and ad buyers on how to reach the gaming generation. Nice. Okay, so you mentioned yeah. Anzu there. Yeah. There's another company <laughs> that I was looking up. Um, so there's like Greenfly. Yeah. If I wrote this down correctly, <laughs> content distribution, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, now, I can personally see how a company like Anzu and Greenfly would make sense yeah. in that commerce, entertainment, sports, reimagining. Uh, sort of theme. Yeah. Then at the same time, you have a company called For Days, which is just a, it's not just, but it's a recycling platform. Yep. You have New Era ADR, which is a legal dispute resolution platform. Yep. Now I'm thinking Marquee Ventures. I'm thinking entertainment, commerce, yep. sports. I'm certainly not thinking legal dispute resolution. Yeah. And uh, what was the other one? It was, uh, and, and recycling. So how does that fit within the thesis? Or yeah. was it just kind of an off thesis thing that you said looks good? Talk yeah. us through that. Yeah, and there's, there's one we, we put up there last week that you'd, even, you'd scratch your head even more, but I'm happy to <laughs> uh, tell you about it. So, so um, again, our, our thesis is really like inside out, right? So like what do we see at the Cubs? What do we see with our partners? Um, 
So four, four days, which is actually now called Trashy, they rebranded, <laughs> uh, and launched at Walmart uh, last month. Um, so look, the, the consumer insight there and the problem there is um, consumers are making different choices now. They want to be sustainable, and I know they've said that for decades, but they actually are making decisions now to be more sustainable. Um, so when you look at sustainability and you look at like what the Cubs do um, and in sports in general, right? Uh, apparel is a massive waste stream. Um, and also, you know, we, we try to get our consumers to upgrade their jerseys, to get the new, you know, city hat, get the new London series hat. Um, but what happens to everything that, that uh, you get rid of, right? And, and the, the, the crazy thing is like 85, I'm going deep on this one because it, I think it'll explain a little bit more of the thesis, but um, 85% of what you donate to Goodwill uh, or, or other donation uh, streams uh, gets thrown away. Um, and that, that's the EPA study. Um, so there's really, you know, apparel um, and linens and towels, it's a massive uh, cause of um, landfill waste, right? So what is beautiful about Trashy they figured out a sustainable, uh, I guess it's like a circular model, right? You recycle your clothes with them, you get a credit to their um, marketplace or for using, uh, you know, you can use across their uh, browser plugin or you can use at the Cub store. And then you can buy clothes you would normally buy anyways, right? So essentially you're getting future credits by recycling. And the company makes money both on the recycling side and then on uh, customer um, acquisition, right? So they're, they're driving more sustainable consumers to brands that are willing to offer these credits. So we, we did some testing with the Cubs retail stores, um, but when you think about the broader sports landscape, um, there's, a, there's a, a, a tremendous amount of jerseys and t-shirts and you know, whatever uh, pullovers uh, that people get rid of every year. And so we wanted to figure out a way to tie all those threads together that's a good pun I just thought of. And then the last one on the legal side. So New Era, um, brilliant, brilliant team of technologists and ex-lawyers who hated the way um, essentially brands, consumers, and B2B relationships ended in, in, uh, in disputes. And so they built a new platform from that. It actually took off in ticketing first. So they're in, uh, now they're in probably uh, one and a half billion contracts, but the, their first couple of customers were actually in sports and entertainment. So they launched with Ticketmaster, they launched with Zynga, uh, they work with the US Olympic Committee now. So what we saw was this unique ability we had to build on that with other sports organizations, uh, whether that's ticketing, whether that's sponsors. Um, and we, we thought this was a unique way to take sports as a wedge uh, rather than an angle um, to build their bigger business, so. Well, and I'll tell you, the uh, <laughs> old jerseys in my house, yes. <laughs> I, well, you know, if they don't get thrown away. Collector's items? Yeah, you know, they're gonna end up being $400 <laughs> for right. someone's old raggedy thing at, you know, at a yeah. vintage shop. Right. Or in my case, I'm still hanging on to that 1995 champion Muggsy yeah. Bogues jersey. Don't get rid of that one. Fits like a sports bra now, but <laughs> still in the closet. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know what, Ashley, back in college, I loaned you a Michael Jordan jersey, and I'm still <laughs> waiting for that one back. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about like the landscape of sports and media right now. Yep. We're seeing an insane amount of money being put into professional sports, primarily from licensing deals and TV rights. Mm -hmm. uh, the NBA, I think, is getting 2.5, 2.6 billion a season mm -hmm. from Disney, uh, from ABC, ESPN, yeah. to be able to broadcast uh, their games. Uh, even recently, the WWE is getting a billion, a ten-year billion-dollar deal from Netflix to live stream uh, Monday Night Raw, their Monday show. So just a ton of money is going into like streaming yep. and broadcast rights, which is now having like a, a massive ripple effect overall on what sports can do, what sports teams can do, what the leagues can do. Yeah. What do you see as like greenfield opportunity, given this like kind of this new money that's come in and this big influx of cash? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's good times uh, to be the leagues, but but I think you know underlying all this is is the fact that live sports still bring people together. Like it's one of the last areas of media where you can kind of bring together a live audience. Um, people don't watch live shows anymore. 
Um, you know, there are a couple of concerts here and there, but everyone's streaming on their own time. Um, so it's hard to reach that audience, right? So, so you have to think like underpinning this massive sports rights deal, that it's all about advertisers, right? Like they're, they're, the NBA isn't getting two and a half billion just because people you know, think they deserve it. Uh, they're getting it right because you can sell advertising against that and advertisers are voracious for live content that they know people are going to sit down and watch in front of their, even their iPad, right? But, you know, TV screens are still the biggest, best screen for individuals, right, to reach them, to show a beautiful product, to show a car or whatever, you know, new, new pharma, pharma yeah. pill is out there. <laughs> um, but it does... You know, the, the question becomes, where does that money go? Um, you just saw the NFL uh, increase their salary cap significantly more than they thought. So a lot of it's going to players, um, but you know, a lot of it's also getting invested in new facilities um, and uh, probably uh, you know, driving up the value of the sports teams. So on that note, yeah. um, I was just having a conversation with a friend about this over the weekend. Um, Recently, over the winter in baseball, for everyone who, anyone who follows baseball, the biggest player contract with Shohei Otani came out where he signed a 10-year, $700 million contract. We are, in my opinion, I was like, I was talking to my friend, I was like, we got to be like three to five years away from a billion-dollar contract coming out. Do you see like us hitting that point sooner than that, later than that, right in that sweet spot? So three to five years? Yeah. I, I, I'm sure the baseball guys won't like me answering this, but... Um, <laughs> Look, the, the Shohei deal is unique in that he, it's totally backloaded for those who aren't in, in, the, in the sports world. Like he's actually only getting, I think, $2 million a year. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's, getting, he's collecting all the rest of it afterwards. And that's for... $680 like, yeah. million in year 11 is what he's collecting. Right, <laughs> right. So, so it's really, if, if, if that is allowed, like, yes, you will get to a billion dollars probably, you know, in, uh, in the next three, three to four years. Um, but there, there's also other moving parts in sports, right? Like... Do these media rights continue? Mm. Um, you've got a few that are coming up in the next four or five years. We'll see if there's many bidders um, in the streaming world, uh, right? Netflix is buying more uh, live, um, Amazon. So, so you need that to, to continue. Um, you need this loophole uh, to allow these extended deals where you're paying someone over 20 years, mm -hmm. even though they're only playing for you know, five. Um, so I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's improbable. I think it's likely we will we will see a, a billion dollar headline number, and then the the key for everyone here is go go look under the hood and see what that actually means. <laughs> and either way, it's still a billion dollars. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's a lot of cash, <laughs> uh, and the city of Los Angeles is like trying to restructure it yeah. against them because they're like, so we're going to miss out on collecting yeah. all that tax revenue yeah. for the next ten years. Yeah. And I bet by year eleven they'll have figured out a new restructure That's of the deal. Right that defers it longer or adjusts right. the payment amount or whatever it might be. Um, let's come back to uh, Marquee as an investment vehicle, an investment fund. Um, when you look at the portfolio you've already invested in, what would you say are some of the common founder traits? Mm -hmm. And as you look forward for new investments, what do you look for in a founder? Yeah. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have a, a great group. We have uh, nine companies in the portfolio today. Um, I would say, you know, consistent themes, management teams who, you know, it's, it's not their first go around. I'm trying to think if we, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And when I say not first go around, not that they're, uh, they've all been successful before, but they've all learned, right? And they've all, they've all uh, demonstrated um, takeaways from their previous, uh, previous endeavors. And so I think, I think actually the ones who have, who have uh, back to failure, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think the ones who failed before um, are just smarter. They, they, they waste less money. They have um, people, and, and not to say there aren't good first time founders, but um, you just, you get the sense that they're more in control uh, in an uncontrolled, uncontrolled situation, right? Um, I think the other thing is they're obsessed with the problem, not necessarily their technology. Um, so they're obsessed with like the consumer problem or the business problem they're solving. You know, what, 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 they, they, they almost like have empathy uh, to an extreme for that problem or for their, you know, their customers. Um, and they're great salespeople, right? Which is, I mean, as, as you mentioned early on, like they, they know how to sell. Like I need to feel comfortable that they can sell investors, that they can sell employees, 
um, and then if they can sell customers. Because at, at the beginning, um, you're, the, you're the chief salesman as, as a CEO. So we're always looking for, you know, do we feel comfortable this person can recruit the best talent, they can get other investors, uh, and they can bring on customers and figure out a way to then uh, level themselves up uh, for, that, for that next stage, right? So you know, when, you, when you're in venture, you're not investing for like a one-year horizon. So we're kind of thinking through the next 10 years, like, can this person run this company now? Could they run it if they get you know, to 10 million in revenue? And can they bring in a team then to you know, not necessarily take over, but take over a lot of the functions because the CEO is not gonna be able to uh, sell every customer even once you, you know, get to series A, so. So then conversely, yeah. what are red flags in a founder? Or even beige flags? <laughs> beige flags, I don't know if I've seen a beige flag. Um, uh, I'd say overconfidence, but that, that's a tricky one, right? Because every founder, you know, they're, they'll, they're willing to run through walls, uh, but there, there's something to be said for like acknowledging the unknowns or acknowledging the challenges you've had. Um, you know, there, there's a respect from that because you're going to have more challenges along the way and you're going you're gonna to have missteps. And so understanding that someone can acknowledge those and learn from those and take feedback is important. Um, so when I say overconfidence, it's I'm not worried about raising money or I'm not worried about hiring. I've got the best product in the world. I'm not worried. You know, when it, if someone says I'm not worried, I kind of get a little worried. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, and then, and then over overselling, like telling telling us that you have customer deals, or telling us you have partners lined up, and you know we're gonna we're gonna dig into that. Like if you if you tell me you're selling to Walmart, or you have a a big deal in place with with you know you pick the name, like we're not gonna just write a check before you know investigating that. So so those things always bring up red flags. Like or he said he you know he or she, she said they are far along in this process, but you've only had one phone call. Like, we don't, we don't deal well at Marquee with uh, misleading us, so that one's always a red flag. So don't lie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got it, don't lie. Well, actually, to that point, um, <laughs> speaking of lying. Yeah, speaking of lying. Um, one thing that I have been in, a lot of the clients I work with with Startup Hype Man, one of the things we've been doing over the last year or so is adding a slide to the deck well, or as part of the ask slide, just having a section of it yeah. that says, here's where we need help. And just yeah. kind of being upfront and transparent about the gaps that this founder acknowledges yeah. they have and where they think the firm they're talking to potentially could yep. have resources for them. Yep. Do you see that as the right level of confidence and, and knowing yeah. limits or? Yeah, I, I like that. Um, here's what we're looking for from our investors. I think is a great, a great pitch because it also helps us um, determine if we're a good fit, right? And, and we're also always looking at fit as one of our, our key priorities. Um, I would take it one step further and say, here are the things we don't know yet. Mm. And here's, here's what we're doing to figure that out. So like, think about it from a, a scientific, you know, scientific process standpoint. Um, here's our hypothesis. Here's what we're gonna test. And here's what we're gonna do after we find out the answer from that test. And here's how much the test is gonna cost, right? So I, I love founders who think like the scientific method um, because everything's test and learn and iterate. So the more I can see you're thinking about iterating and, and telling me what you need to figure out to reach that next level, to, that, that to me shows that kind of next uh, layer of thinking. Um, one, of the, one of the things that Marquis promotes is yeah. investing at the early stage, but then kind of qualifies that with uh, product in market or, or mm -hmm. product market fit. So yep. every, every firm that says early stage yeah. has a little bit Correct. different version of that. Some yeah. mean pre-revenue, pre-product, whatever it could yeah. be. Some mean way later than that. Uh, can you just kind of give yeah. the, the very crystal description of how Marquee yeah. views early stage? Yeah, yeah, early stage is a moving target. Uh, so, so we think about it as in terms of like what we can help with and what we can do and what we're good at, right? So I think pre-market, you know, we don't have like real deep product chops. Like I, I don't have people on our team who are super strong at getting in the weeds on, on building or fixing a product, right? But what we do have is the ability to act as a megaphone, the ability to leverage our global network, um, the ability to get stuff in front of the right people. Um, and so we want companies that have revenue traction. To give you a, a specific number, we usually use a million dollar run rate kind of as a, as a, a benchmark. 
Uh, we've invested slightly below that where we saw a line of sight to the million. Um, but we want a company that's getting into scaling mode in, in uh, you know, within early stage, right? So mm -hmm. that, is that specific enough? Yeah? I think so. Okay. Or, or do we like that yeah. answer? Yeah? Yeah? All right. Okay. <laughs> Two thumbs up from the, four <laughs> yeah. thumbs up from yeah. the Schultz brothers. That's right. That's right. Um, as you kind of look ahead across uh, commerce, mm -hmm. entertainment, and sports, um, like obviously sports betting yeah. is a big category that just continues to grow, I think. As I look at it, I see a lot of opportunity with the kind of the changing literal physical mm -hmm. landscape of stadiums themselves being yep. these like entertainment centers and their own little like ballpark villages yeah. that are being built. Yep. Um, obviously, you know, the reconstruction of Wrigleyville has yeah. been one example of that. But even like SoFi in LA, mm -hmm. right? You know, just kind of take an entirely yeah. new plot of land and you go there for an event, but ideally you're sticking around for nine other things that are going on and it can be used for other purposes, even when there's that's not right. just an event there. Um, whether it is on-site or whether it's something that's online, yep. what are some of the other areas that you personally are excited about as you look at this media, commerce, entertainment, yeah. sports landscape? Yeah, it's, um, it's a, we, we have a lot of themes within there that we're constantly looking at, but I think you're right. On the, on the facility side, um, you know, there are a lot of great companies, like our real estate arm, Marquee Development, is doing a lot of those projects. Uh, where they're, it's, it's all about getting people to spaces uh, more often, right? So c teams don't want an empty stadium, uh, you know, 300 days a year. So it's, it's how do you use that footprint uh, to get people to do other things and, and engage, right, with the community? Um, but, you know, on the, on the facility side, we're, we're looking at a lot of sustainability tools, um, clean energy, waste reduction, um, reusable things. Uh, we've looked at um, cashierless checkout, and I think we're still in the, the early innings of cashierless checkout. Let's see where that goes. Um, on the commerce side, we, we've, uh, we continue to look at um, new ways to engage with consumers, uh, how brands connect. Um, we actually just made an investment uh, on the fits in our commerce pillar, but in data privacy. Um, we believe that consumers are looking for more and more opportunities to um, protect their, their data um, and value their data more. Um, and then on the sports side, we, we are looking at a few emerging leagues and concepts. Um, so we, we keep looking for, for that. Um, kind of what, what are people going to be watching you know, 10 years from now? Um, I hope it's baseball, but I hope it's also some other things. Um, and there you go. Women's sports is, a, is a, a really interesting area. We spent some time there. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to play women's sports. Um, not yeah, actually yeah, play women's you. sports, but how to invest in women's sports. Um, that would be funny, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, it would be the most manly yeah, thing yeah. ever to try and figure out how to play women's yeah, sports. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> um, so I think that, that'll give you a, a feel for, and then there's the AI kind of AI everything layer uh, that we're digging into. Um, uh, so we're, we're looking at how AI interfaces with media companies how teams use AI, and that, that kind of is in our Greenfly uh, investment mm -hmm. and, and some of our others. So there, I think if you're not looking at how AI is going to change the world right now, you're probably going to miss some stuff. I know a lot of people think it you know, might be overblown, and that could be, but I, I think it, it's still got a lot of legs to it. So you, know, you mentioned as part of your response, like yeah. you talked about like marquee development yeah. and, and marquee network and all yeah. these things. So is the idea then the right investment is going to be one that you can plug into the other properties that, are, that kind of revolve in the Cubs ecosystem? Mm. Um, we, I would say we've done that with, uh, so of the nine portfolio companies, maybe three, three or four of them uh, are actually like working with kind of the, the, the broader ecosystem. Um, the others though, you know, they're things that we can help. So, um, you know, for, for Anzu, for example, right? Like, we don't have a video game, but we know a lot of people who produce video games. And we know a lot of people at the leagues who control video games. Um, so, so we can help them navigate that. We also understand what sponsors are looking for and how brands are changing their purchasing behaviors uh, when you think of marketing activations. So um, we don't require it. We don't require a direct vendor relationship, um, either before, after, or during an investment. They're completely independent decisions. Um, so if, if, it, if it would help the Cubs and I bring it to 
you know, a colleague at Marquee Development, for example, and it's a real estate business or a prop tech company, um, you know, I, I want my colleague to make an independent decision on that, uh, not just because uh, we invested. We have been in, to say the least, a bit of a VC winter over the last year. Um, a lot of money available, but sitting on the sidelines. Um, what's your kind of, you know, today yeah. is, what is this, uh, March 19th, 2024. <clears throat> what's your outlook today, and is that different from March 19th of 2023? Um, yeah, and, and <laughs> I hope the VC market doesn't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> fall, fall off a cliff. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think I think we're getting we're getting closer to the bottom. It's impossible to really. If I could be call a bottom, I'd be, uh, you know, on a on a yacht somewhere. But um, it feels like deals are getting done quicker. It feels like we're seeing some preemptive rounds. Um, it feels like. VCs are starting to do more sourcing as I talk to colleagues. This is all anecdotal, right? So, and I think this is since Q3, Q4 even. So it feels like things are picking up. Um, you know, hopefully we get some more IPOs out this year, which typically helps um, uh, a lot of big check writers at the later stages write uh, growth rounds, which then I think spurs the earlier rounds. Uh, the, the one area we haven't seen a slowdown in is seed, seed investing. I think you had a lot of multi-stage funds uh, go a lot earlier, so they could almost, uh, you know, think of seed investing as a harbor, right? There's like the crazy waves out, out in the ocean. No one knows how to price growth rounds. Um, but, you know, seed, you can kick the can. You can say, we're not, we don't really need to worry about growth rounds for five, seven years, right? So let, let's invest money there. So I think seed rounds haven't come down as much as all the other uh, stages. Um, but I, you know, all that being said, there's, there was still a ton of companies that raised money over the last two to three years. And whether that's price rounds or bridge rounds, uh, they need to get worked through, right? They're, uh, they price the rounds you know, high in the, uh, in the, in the heady days, um, or they, they raised a ton of money in bridge rounds with the goal of raising around this year. I think you're gonna see a lot of companies uh, close up shop this year, probably a lot more than last year. Um, but I think that's a good thing, right? Because a lot of those companies haven't shown the traction or, well, good thing unless you're running it, right? It's a <laughs> terrible thing to shut down a company, but um, you know, they just haven't proven that next phase of growth. They haven't proven their milestones. Um, so I think we're gonna see, I was looking at data this morning on, on shutdowns this quarter um, relative to last year, and it's about double, but I think it's gonna pick up. Again, if you look at the second half of the year, I think we're gonna have a, a lot more companies out trying to raise when you know the market should tell them that they shouldn't be raising more capital. So uh, I've got yeah. one more question, and we'll open it up to the audience for a couple questions, and then I've got a closing one I want to ask you. Yeah. But let's let's come back to, um, well, not come back to you, but I want to kind of change gears for just a moment. Still staying on Marquee. So um, Marquee recently launched a interview series on their blog yeah. called Is it uh, Nine Innings? Yeah. Nine Innings, yeah. yeah. You can see the tie back to the Chicago uh, Cubs just in the name of that blog. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so the whole point of that interview series is, you know, you're interviewing industry leaders mm -hmm. across those three verticals, right? right uh, commerce, sports, entertainment, um, around what yeah. their outlook is on trends mm -hmm. um, and just general sort of insights they yeah. have on the industry. Um, to like, what we've seen, I think that is drastically different, you can come back to one of my first questions about like 20 years ago, how yeah. is VC different? Yeah. And you kind of mentioned there's kind of a whole industry now around yeah. it. Part of the industry of VC is having a point of view and really broadcasting that point of view. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of funds have a position called director of platform where right. like, you know, their kind of, their job is to have the VC fund almost be like a marketing vehicle mm -hmm. as well. So what would you say is like the marquee point yeah. of view as it pertains to the industry overall and like what, what voice do you want marquee to have and how do you see that coming to life beyond, or is it, is it this and more or yeah. is it staying in the blog category? Yeah, so, so the, uh, the genesis of, of nine innings, it, um, we, we wanted to 
share our voice. We wanted to, and, and look, everything we're doing is really designed to connect with founders um, because we're not raising money right now. Um, we're not trying to build you know, uh, outreach to LPs. Um, what we wanted to do was share the, the depth and breadth of our network. Um, we wanted to share some of the points of view we have um, with some of the questions we write. Um, but we, we also realized that there are a lot of podcasts out there, and for us to break through on a podcast, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was going to take a lot. Um, we also knew there were a lot of newsletters out there that have a ton of content. So we wanted to do something short, pithy, um, you know, quick hitting that you could read uh, and move on with your day. Um, so that was kind of the concept behind it. I, th I think we'll do more. You know, we just had our um, portfolio summit uh, down in uh, Scottsdale last week um, at Cub Spring Training, which is pretty fun. Um, and we brought together speakers um, from the venture world, from the sports world, um, uh, founders exited before. Um, so we're kind of founder first, and we wanted to deliver kind of messages from people in the sectors that we know well uh, that might resonate with founders in those, in those fields. So that, that's kind of the, the ethos behind it. Um, you know, will we ever have a director of platform? You know, I don't know. Um, but it's all about value for the founders. Yeah. Let's uh, open it up for some questions. Yeah. I think we'll get one or two right here. Your hand is first. Yeah. What's your name? Cara. Cara? Cara, yes. Cara. What's your question? Mm. Or if you're more focused on kind of the more professional world or everything yeah. going out there. And if so, where is that on your radar <laughs> and how are you thinking about it? Yeah. The question for anyone who didn't hear and from Cara was, is Marquee looking at NIL? For those who are not familiar, that's name, image, likeness. And that is the, now, the newer ability of NCAA athletes to make money off of their, their name and their asset as a personal brand. Yeah. The, the really scary thing is NIL is now creeping into high school. So they're actually like high school athletes who <laughs> are getting paid to do ads. Yeah. Um, we, we've looked at it. We've looked at a few companies, and there's some we, we really like. Um, it's still like the Wild West. I mean, schools are struggling to manage it. Um, and I don't, think, I don't think it's reached like its mature state. I think we're going to have more and more changes. It's also messing with just the overall sports world. Like you have colleges that are paying athletes more than they'd make in the NFL. Um, they're like one example um, down at Texas, Arch Manning, he's making like I don't, three, three to five million a year. He's making more than his rookie contract would pay him if he, if he went to the NFL. So there, I don't think we've seen the end of, of how that's going to evolve and there are going to be haves and have nots and schools are also dealing with transfer portal, so kids are transferring every year now to go for more money. Um, so, so yes, whenever you have chaos like that, it, pre, it actually produces a good opportunity for startups. So we just haven't decided what the right, uh, what the right solutions are yet. Yeah. Good question. Let's go again. Anyone else have a question for Eric? No? Yeah? Yes, right here. Hi, I'm Preston Jocko. My question is, for a startup that is early stage, yeah. earlier stage than the early yeah. stage you're looking for, what are some creative ways of showing that product market fit? Like, I'm developing a physical product, so I yeah. don't have something selling yet, but are there ways we've seen that that appeal to you as a as a VC? Yeah. The question from Preston is, as an earlier stage company that might be earlier than what Marquis defines as early stage, what are the creative ways that one could showcase product market fit? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, user, user feedback uh, is great. It, it doesn't show mass product market fit, but if you can show me that someone's getting rid of something, to use your product instead. Um, if you have distribution deals um, pre-wired, like that, that can also show it. Um, at the end of the day, you need some, um, you, you really need for us like something quantifiable. Um, and I know that that's hard. I didn't truly answer you know, sig signal-wise. Um, 
user testing is great. Like if the raw data and user feedback. Um, yeah, it's uh, that's a, that's a tough one just because we don't do a lot of seed and like pre-seed stuff. Um, but you know, I'm sure you've had speakers who can <laughs> who deal with that more, right? Well, I think yeah, that's and that's what they'll they'll often say is like, do you have user feedback, testimonials, letters of intent if it's yeah. you know business product? Um, do you have a healthy looking pipeline if it's business related? Um, but I also think what you can do at this stage, if, I, I, remember, I don't remember off the top of my head what your product is, but if it does, if it would fit within the marquee thesis is start to get on Eric's yeah. radar now and just kind of send him updates over time yeah. so that way when it does fit, yeah. you know, he's warmed up to the idea, right? Yeah, and we, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we take meetings weekly with all sorts of companies that are too early. Um, but what it does do is it allows us to get to know you to our earlier point, like, get to know what kind of leader you are. Uh, did you follow through on what you told us you were going to do? Um, uh, and we actually have, a, we have a, a, a dedicated amount of time every week that we use to go out and meet companies that are going to raise in a year, right? So we're, we think about our pipeline, like not just this month, but like in 2025. So we, we want to build that now for, for then. There was one in the back, you had your hand up. Um, so, sorry, first, what's your name? Maggie? Did I get that right? Maggie? Yeah. Yeah, and it was, what's your favorite thing about opening day at the Cubs? <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, 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 I, uh, hopefully the weather. <laughs> 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 no, I think the coolest thing is um, the, the atmosphere is, is very unique. If anyone hasn't been there, uh, it's, it's both a, like, throwback in time, and also just everyone is so excited, and the Cubs have a really interesting celebrity following, so you, get, you never know who's going to show up that day. Um, and, and so it's, I actually think the bad weather makes it what it is. So if, if it is cold, if it is windy, you have everyone out there cheering, cheering for the, you know, the national anthem, and they're cold and, and you know, want to go inside, but there's, there's really no place they'd rather be, and you see people like Bill Murray, and you see people, you know, it's it's a pretty cool experience. The the flyover is also fun, and there's a, there's a lot of fun stuff about it. Yeah. And it helps when the team is projected to be good too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, okay. A couple of quick final questions here before we wrap up or to wrap us yeah. up. Um, who's a player you'd like to see on the Cubs that has not played on the Cubs before? And let's talk like dream, but like obviously you can't get Otani because he's locked That's in for right. the next ten years. Uh, again, the baseball guys probably don't want me talking about this. Uh, I'm going to go uh, Juan Soto because I think he's going to be coming up. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. I think he'd look good in the, the pinstripes, the cubby blue. I think that dog barking in the yeah. corner echoed that opinion. That's right. Um, where, if people are interested in Marquee, interested in yeah. learning more and getting in touch with you, what's the right way to do that? Yeah. Um, so you can go to our website, marqueeventures.com. You can uh, reach, reach us there or just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, shoot me a note. I'm pretty, pretty, uh, I check that frequently. So, um, yeah, feel free. My last question. So I'm going to, we're going to extract this audio and it's going to get pushed into the Startup Hype Man podcast nice. feed. Why not kill two birds with one stone, right? Yeah. So on my podcast, the last question I always ask my guests is to fill in the blank. So I'll ask you the same thing. Yeah. Fill in the blank. Entrepreneurship is blank. It's just hard. <laughs> right? It is. It is. And so if anyone, if anyone tells you it's easy, it's, it's not. Um, it's one of the hardest things you can do. But the, if you're passionate about it, if you love what you're building, if you love your, your customer, um, it's also rewarding, but I don't, don't, don't mislead anyone. It's hard, right? <laughs> Indeed. Hear, hear. All right, so we brought him in with that amazing standing ovation, and we're going to send him out in the same way. Everybody on your feet, let's give it up one more time for Eric the Hammer! That's, that's awesome, man. i got to bring you to meetings and have you do that. Hell yeah. <laughs>